The date is February 11, 2008. We're at the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies in Athens, Georgia. My name is Craig Braden. I'm the media archivist for the Russell Library. With us today is Bob Short. Bob, if you would, state your full name, your date of birth, and where, where you were born. My name is Bob Short. I was born on the 17th day of April, 1932, in Clayton, Georgia, Rabin County. All right. Um, well, this is the second installment in a series of interviews we're doing with Bob. Um, Bob, we talked before Christmas a little bit about mm -hmm. some of your early life and early career. Um, at this point, we're going to move on from where you were in the early 60s towards when you worked for Jimmy Carter, leading up towards that campaign. So my first question is, in 1966, you were Jimmy Carter's campaign manager in his bid for governor. How did you land that job? Well, let me first say that, that Jimmy really didn't have a campaign manager. Mm -hmm. I was campaign coordinator. And uh, the getting, getting there is a long, long story, so I'll try to make it as brief as I can. Uh, I had a good friend, uh, Senator Brooks Pennington from uh, Madison, you know, the seed mm -hmm. man, and, and Brooks had talked to me about the possibility of coming and, and working in this campaign. Uh, he was a big supporter of Governor Sanders, and that's where really I got to know Brooks so well. So he, uh, he asked me if I would be interested in, uh, in working in the campaign uh, every day. Uh, and so I had a little problem with that because my friend Zell Miller was running for Congress up in the 9th District, uh, uh, my home area, and, uh, and he had asked me to come and, and run his campaign for him. So I had to make a decision and uh, I finally decided that, uh, that perhaps it would be uh, wiser uh, on my part to, uh, to try to help Jimmy Carter. The, the the story beyond that is that there, there was a group of youngsters, <laughs> including myself, uh, who had a great interest in that race. As you recall, the, uh, the race started out between uh, Governor Vandiver, for whom I had worked and uh, who was, I considered a very, very good friend, and Ellis Arnold, who had been governor 20 years mm -hmm. before. Uh, but uh, Governor Vandiver became ill, and his doctor said, you know, you can't run. Your life, you know, depends on you not running. Uh, so Governor Vandiver went to Washington to see uh, his mentor, Senator Talmadge, and told Senator Talmadge about the doctor's orders. And for a brief period, Senator Talmadge uh, was considering uh, joining the race. In fact, he, he held a news conference in Washington and said that he was he was uh, considering the running because so many people had asked him to come back home and, and run for governor, which he, he really enjoyed being governor. Uh, Senator Talmadge would have told you that. He loved being governor. It's, it's much more exciting and, uh, and you can accomplish a lot more than sitting in the Senate uh, up there in Washington. But uh, he finally decided after being uh, coached by a number of big important Georgians that he's better off for Georgia in Washington than he would be as governor. So he withdrew, or, or didn't announce. He, mm -hmm. he, he did have a news conference saying that he'd considered it and he had decided not to run. Well, that left the Talmadge forces without a candidate. So they turned to James Gray, who was a publisher, uh, very intelligent, uh, articulate, uh, handsome guy from Albany, uh, to, to represent the Talmadge camp. Uh, so you had, uh, at that point, you had uh, Ellis Arnold, and you had James Gray, and you had Lester Maddox, who, frankly, uh, nobody really gave a chance. So there was an opportunity there. There was a vacuum there. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of us young guys were looking around for somebody to support. Uh, and, and honestly, uh, we, we uh, looked at Charlie, Representative Charlie Jones down at Hinesville. Uh, you might remember, uh, Charlie was not all that interested. And then Senator John Gaynor, who was a, a, a very electable, uh, would be a very electable candidate. And John decided against it. But Jimmy, who at that point was a shoe-in for Congress down in his home district, 
because Bo Calloway, who also was in the governor's race as a Republican, uh, decided not to run and run, run for governor instead, and Jimmy had a lock on that seat. Uh, but after uh, a lot of uh, consulting with many, many people, he decided he would run for governor. And so uh, there we were, uh, a new candidate uh, in the race and, uh, and a big job to do uh, in order to get him known, well enough known, mm -hmm. uh, to be a serious, serious candidate. So that's how that started. Mm -hmm. Can you describe for me briefly what was the feeling at the time? Why so many candidates in this race? Um, I, I've, I've heard suggested that it was because of the, the 1964 and 65 federal decisions with regard to civil rights. But was there, were there a lot of people vying for this seat more than usual because of certain things that were happening on a national level? I, I wouldn't think so. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, most of those candidates actually shared basically uh, the same philosophy on civil rights. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to in those days to get any votes because right. as you know, and as much as I hate to tell you, if you don't know, uh, Georgia was not exactly out front mm -hmm. uh, in, in uh, school integration and in, in integration of public accommodation. Mm -hmm. So as Ernie Vanderbilt once said, once said, you know, if you're not a segregationist, you can't get within 100 miles of the state capital. Mm -hmm. So on that issue, I think everybody was, was about the same. Mm -hmm. Governor Arnold might have been a little more liberal mm -hmm. on racial matters than, than most of the other candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the reason he was able to uh, lock up the uh, minority vote mm -hmm. uh, right off the bat. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that, I don't think civil rights really was an issue. Okay. Uh, it's certainly not as, as strong an issue as it was in previous years mm -hmm. when, when uh, the Talmages and, uh, and Marvin Griffin and others used segregation really as the, uh, as the center of their campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there were a spate of candidates, including a Republican, very strong Republican candidate, that would end up in the general election running, um, partly because of Goldwater's success, I would assume, earlier in the decade in Georgia. Um, but then you had this enormous string, this long string of Democratic candidates. Right. Um, describe for us the campaign in general, and both your, your involvement with Carter and some of the other stories that, that you've that you've told us over time about about the campaign. Well, well, first of all, I think it's important to understand that Jimmy Carter was a tireless campaigner. He was up at the crack of dawn, and he he seldom got got home or to bed till the wee hours of the morning, out on the trail. So he he was actually the the uh, centerpiece of that campaign. We had little financing. We had uh, really no media campaign. Uh, it was mostly organization, which, which I did, and, uh, and uh, attempting to get voters from the other candidates, particularly uh, the minorities, mm -hmm. uh, where, where uh, Carter certainly had a chance uh, to cut into Mr. Arnold's big lead there. Uh, but, but the campaign, uh, there was a wonderful campaign staff. Uh, there was Merle Meacham, who came over from the Vandiver campaign to handle the, the women's division. There was young Hamilton Jordan who came up from uh, uh, Albany, a young young fellow. Then he got to be famous and, and and quite a quite quite a campaigner. He was a he was a good thinker and he understood, uh, you know, the basics of campaigning. Mm -hmm. And there was little Steve Dugan who came up from Fort Valley. They were in charge of the youth division, and we hired a fellow named Mr. Ed Holman, and Mr. Holman was really the key. To the whole thing, Mr. Holman was a uh, was a retired Associated Press reporter who knew all of the newsmen. He he was very adept at, at writing uh, uh, good stories, and we utilized him. And I can tell you that I don't think any of the campaigns that year got more press than Jimmy Carter. Even though in the very beginning some of it was negative, uh, you know they called him Jimmy Who, and they they kept 
repeating that he uh, was not well enough known and not well enough financed to, to win the election. But they didn't, what they didn't tell you was that, that he was tireless and he was relentless and he was determined to win that race. And uh, so we campaigned uh, that way. Uh, Jimmy used his family very effectively. Rosalind, you know, he could be in a factory line in Savannah and Rosalind would be in Thomasville at a lady's tea or a reception that the local people had held for her. And then the boys uh, were utilized mostly in, in areas, uh, college campus areas where, where they could go and, and uh, campaign for their, for their dad. So it was a very effective family oriented uh, campaign. Now, one of the things that I'll never forget is that on the first day that I arrived at the campaign headquarters, which was in the Dinkler Plaza Hotel in Atlanta, strangely enough, one floor above James Gray, uh, the, phone, the phones were ringing off the hook and, they, and people were complaining about an ad that someone had authorized uh, uh, this local uh, advertising person who was from Brooklyn <clears throat> and who sang this country song that had seven words. Jimmy Carter is his name. And he sang it over and over and over. His idea was that he wanted people to learn the well, they, they said, take it off. We don't know him, but take it off. So finally, Jimmy got around to, uh, to hiring a, a very good advertising man, uh, Jerry Rafshun. Mm -hmm. Jerry, uh, of course, stayed with, with Governor Carter and President Carter, and I'm sure they're still very good friends today. Mm -hmm. but, but Jerry Rafshun made the most out of the least of anybody I've ever known in politics. So uh, the campaign, whatever uh, public publicity or, or uh, media we got was, was, was because of Rafshun. He, he knew how to stretch dollars and he knew how to market Jimmy Carter. So I don't know what else I can say about that campaign except we all expected to win, uh, but we lost uh, to, to uh, Lester Maddox by 21,000 votes and therefore uh, we're not in the runoff. Had we been in the runoff, uh, I think uh, we would have won mm. the race. Uh, <coughs> and one other thing is that uh, that Jimmy, uh, toward the end there, became a different man. He had learned the ropes. He knew how to run. And it was quite obvious when that election was over that he was absolutely the hero of the Georgia Democratic Party. Was uh, Billy involved at that early stage in his campaign? Billy, Billy uh, I think, if I recall correctly, uh, Billy had just gotten home from the Marines, mm -hmm. and oh yes, Billy was Billy was uh, very active in his area down there. And in fact, uh, the whole family there, uh, Jimmy's sisters, uh, and Billy had a headquarters there in Plains that they uh, that that they ran for Jimmy, and they campaigned in that area down there. Mm -hmm. uh, none of them got into the statewide stuff, but uh, uh, Billy was there. Hmm. Um, now you've you've told me before about some of the the interesting fun stories, fun things, the fun things yeah. about this campaign. Could you elaborate on those a little? Oh bit? yeah, sure. Well, you know, we uh, Jimmy Jimmy was uh, was a and is a very ethical uh, person, and he certainly would not have approved of some of the things that we did for fun. For example, as I said, we were one floor above the James Gray headquarters. And we were told one day that uh, somebody down there was paying one of the maids to take our trash and give it to them so they could go through it and see what we're doing. So we planted a lot of uh, phony <laughs> letters and, and, and thank you notes for endorsements that we didn't have just because it was fun. Uh, uh, and you know, another thing, Senator Pennington was a mischievous kind of guy anyway. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, he invented a, a polling company called Voter Research Institute. 
And every week we would get Mr. Holman to put out a release uh, showing Jimmy Carter slowly moving up the ranks uh, by our polling data. Nobody ever asked about Voter Research Institute. Nobody ever said it didn't exist. So it, was, uh, it got publicity. And it was sort of funny, but in another way, you know, it was sort of not kosher, you know, so to speak. Uh, so, so we did that, and uh, and at, at, as I recall, at the end of the uh, of the uh, season there, the campaign, uh, Jimmy was running just a few percentage points below Governor Arnold because Brooks wanted to make it look believable, mm -hmm. uh, but it had him in the runoff. And so he kept, uh, you know, he just kept gaining a little bit every every week. Uh, that was one. And then the great one was the uh, was sending Garcia to uh, Washington with the postcards. That was another of Senator Pen Pennington's great uh, great tricks. Uh, the the cam campaign, without Jim uh, Jimmy Carter's knowledge, produced some postcard that had a message on there saying that, you know, you, you better vote for Jimmy Carter, or we are, we're asking you to vote for Jimmy Carter because he's the only guy who can beat Ellis Arnold and Bo Calloway, and signed it, concerned friends of Senator Richard Russell and Senator Herman Talmadge. And those were mailed, we sent a fellow up to Washington to mail some from Washington. Some were mailed from Lovejoy, and some were mailed from Winder. Well, the problem was that the guy in Washington, mailed him one day too early, so it gave you know it, it gave uh, uh, J Jim Gray, who who was most concerned about it, an opportunity to respond before uh, before the election. But those are just little things you do in campaigns. Uh -huh. I mean, they might not seem nice, but they're fun, <laughs> and you need fun. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you've looked around uh, uh, in these modern campaigns, you see only young people there, and the reason for it is. It, it is it is so tiring, and unless you're young and can stay up two or three days in a row, you certainly don't want to be a, a campaigner nowadays. Uh, and I think that the old pros are gone. Mm -hmm. You know, they sit in the back rooms and and uh, you know occasionally come up with suggestions and ideas, and uh, which we all like to do. And uh, but they don't get out there in the forefront like they used to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. During this campaign, Lester Maddox told you that Bob Short would be working for him someday. Yes, he did. Did you ever imagine you would, in fact, be working for him by the time the year was out or by no, the beginning of the no, next year? No, I didn't. That, that, that came about, and uh, I went down to Eastman, Georgia, to speak for Senator Carter uh, at a political rally. It was on a football field on the flatbed, and uh, and everybody drew names or drew numbers out of a hat to see how you spoke, you know. And uh, and I was seated next to uh, to Maddox, Governor Maddox, or Mr. Maddox at the time, and we you know we made small talk, and uh, and he's good at that. I'm not, but he is. And so I got up and made my speech and uh, sat back down, and. Uh, and when it got time for him, uh, he got up and and it was you know it was strange it was eerie, because it was it was threatening to rain, and in fact it was misting rain, and he spoke and all of a sudden the sun came out <laughs> and the sky turned blue and the people started listening. And uh, you know they didn't pay attention to what I said obviously there's a lot of noise but they listened to it, and uh, and. Uh, as we left, uh, he said something to the effect that, well, you sure are a nice speaker. Uh, uh, one of these days you're going to be on my side. And so, you know, I just sort of laughed and went on and got on the airplane to go back. Uh, a fellow named Jerry Franks, uh, who was for Carter, uh, was flying the airplane. And uh, I said, Jerry, did you notice those people out there when, when Lester Maddox spoke? They, they were very attentive, there was no noise, they stopped milling about, and, and actually I think that whatever he said resonated with that crowd. So then we talked about, well now how can the fellow win? Can he really win? How can he win? Well we both I think decided that he couldn't win, 
because he, first of all, he knew uh, no politicians in the state, and he had no organization. All he had was his Pontiac station wagon and his and his uh, uh, stapler and his posters, Maddox Country posters that he carried around the state. So we decided, well, he, he, we didn't think he could win, but we thought that he could actually uh, split a lot of votes with, uh, with James Gray because they were both from that segregation side. And that, that would be helpful, we thought, to us because uh, it would take votes away from Gray, who actually we were a bit afraid of at the time. We, uh, uh, we didn't know how Gray, we knew the Talmadge people would support Gray, but we didn't know to what extent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, uh, Lester Maddox was right. He was right. Had no idea at the time, and it hadn't. In the circumstances uh, following that uh, election and the, and the runoff, uh, really, uh, is what solidified that thing. What was the message that made Maddox so compelling to people? What made them listen on that day? Well, it, it was uh, it was uh, <clears throat> federal interference in local affairs, economy and efficiency in government. People weren't getting their money's worth. Taxes were too high. You know, actually, Craig, I'll tell you, it's the same thing you hear in every campaign before and since. But for some reason, uh, uh, I, 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 really, I couldn't explain it. I don't know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. he, he had what he called his Society of Liberty platform. And basically that was, uh, you know, anti-school integration, uh, anti-federal government activities, anti-welfare, and, and a lot of those, those, uh, those issues that at one time uh, you had to embrace if you were going to be a conservative. Mm -hmm. So I think probably that, uh, that that's why, if now that he, makes any sense. It does. Now, did he, he, and, he and Gray had something of a falling out during the campaign, didn't they? No. Uh, Actually, no. Or was was there a? I don't think so. There was some allegation having to do with a payoff. Oh well, yeah, right? that's that's another story. That's another story. Can you explain that a little? Bit? Well, I can tell you what I know. Okay. You know, and it was told to me by Governor Maddox uh -huh. was that that he was uh, he was at a convention in Macon uh, when a third party came to him and said, uh, "There's some people here who would like to see you and." Uh, they want to talk to you, and I'd appreciate if you if you'd talk to them. And he said, "Well, what do they want?" And the guy, you know, played innocent, said, "I don't really know, Lester, but you know, you should talk to him." And so he did. He met with them, and they offered him a substantial amount of money to get out of the race. And and of course, you know, Maddox toyed with them. And uh, but what they didn't know was that uh, that stationed next to the door uh, was an Atlanta uh, co a Constitution reporter by the name of Sam Hopkins who heard the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Sam, uh, you know, later wrote of it, but, uh, but he could identify the people involved, but uh, it was never actually proven that they were there on behalf of James Gray. So uh, we, you know, you just have to assume, I guess. Mm -hmm. But but they wanted they wanted Maddox out of the race. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. So when the pro the uh, Democratic primary race was over, Maddox wins. At this point, uh, do well, you there's a story between that. Yeah, there's a story between that. Okay, Maddox is in a runoff with with uh, Arnold. Uh -huh. Carter is out of the race. Right. Uh, uh, Arnold's campaign managers, he had managers, one was Walter Sanders from his hometown of Noonan, the other was John Greer, who was a well-known uh, uh, Atlanta uh, state representative who had represented Lanier County down in South Georgia. Very good political uh, person. Uh, uh, came to me and wanted to know if I would help them talk to some of the Carter people to see if we couldn't get them, if they couldn't get them over to Arnold mm -hmm. uh, in the runoff. Well, uh, I said, well now, 
you know, Governor Arnold wasn't very successful in his campaign methods. You know, what does he plan to do? Nothing. We're not going to spend any money. We're just going to quietly try to persuade people, you know, to come over to his side. And, uh, and he's just going to campaign like he has, shake a few hands and do all that. Well, it suddenly occurred to me that that, that wouldn't get it, that he had to make an effort at least to try to get the Carter people and the other people in the race uh, to have their supporters, you know, work for, for Governor Arnold. So uh, I, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. And, uh, and Maddox, of course, won handily, very handily. He, I think he won by 100,000 votes or more. Uh, so he, uh, he became the Democratic nominee. And there were some pretty stark contrasts between the two, Arnold and Maddox. Yes. Actually, Ellis Arnold was a great governor. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of things that the state needed at the time that he was governor. And, uh, and he, was, he's, he, he has been credited with being one of the better governors the state has ever had, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and justifiably. It had been over 20 years since he had run, or since he had been governor when he yes. ran again. Yeah. Um, you know what? I, I think what hurt Governor Arnold the, the most were the book books he wrote after mm -hmm. he was governor, in, in which he uh, ostensibly uh, challenged the Georgia people and the Southern people to join the Union. Mm -hmm. Well, I learned at a very early age about Georgia people. You just don't tell them what to do, you know, you, the more you try to tell them, the more they won't do it. So mm -hmm. I think that hurt him a good bit. Was this part of also Maddox's success, would you say it could have been part of this reaction to federal involvement um, with regard to things like civil rights and, and um, other issues where the federal government seemed to be encroaching more and the public picked up on that and Maddox picked up on that and he had the voice. Right. So that was that was a theme at the time, mm -hmm. uh, and it all involved you know school uh, desegregation mm -hmm. and uh, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted local control of the schools and and uh, you know all all of those uh, those issues were uh, I think uh, the reason why Maddox ran so strong when he did. Mm -hmm. Uh, other people wouldn't say that. Arnold wouldn't say it. Hmm. Vandery would not have said it had he been in the race. I don't believe uh, James Gray would, would say it. Carter would not say it. So, you know, they had, uh, Maddox had sort of uh, uh, staked out that position. And that was one of Carter's problems, you see. Uh, Carter was caught between Arnold on the left and Maddox on the right and votes in each on each side, but but no very little opportunity to get over to either either side. I mean, you don't want to be uh, a Maddox. You don't want to echo Maddox mm -hmm. uh, and his his position, and and you certainly don't want to echo Arnold mm -hmm. and his position, uh, because Arnold, although he enjoyed the support of mainstream old line Roosevelt Democrats, uh, had had little else going for him at that particular time. Mm -hmm. Maddox wins the runoff and faces Bo Calloway. Mm -hmm. Was it at this point that, when did the Democratic, the folks in the Democratic Party, as you've described to me before, such as Sanders, approached you to help work, work with Maddox? Was it at this point or was it later? It was then. Okay. The, uh, the, the situation was that, uh, well, Jimmy Bentley, mm -hmm. who was a, a good local Georgia politician and office holder, uh, contacted me only uh, three or four days after uh, the primary and asked me if I would come out to talk to him, and I did. And he explained to me what a lot of the powers that be felt about, about Maddox. And so, uh, he, he said that they would like for me to go over there and, and uh, as they put it, uh, <laughs> lend some prestige to, to the Maddox campaign. Well, you know, that, 
that was I couldn't do that. But I said, well, he probably doesn't want me because I was for Carter, and uh, he probably didn't like that and wouldn't like that. And uh, they said, no, that's taken care of. Can you be at his office at 10 o'clock in the morning? So I go over and we talk. And he, and I asked him some very serious questions. I said, you know, what a, who are you? You know, what, <laughs> what are you doing here? How do you think you're gonna win this thing? Are you willing to do certain things? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he, and I thought it out very well. I had my little list with me, Craig, you know, this, that, and the other. And he agreed. And so I, do, I said, well, you know, okay, we're on. And, uh, and I, I started there, uh, and it was just a mess. Uh, he must have had, uh, oh, he had thousands of letters from people all over the country who believed in his philosophy and, and wanted to help. And, they, they were, and he insisted they all be answered. Well, I looked around, and there's nobody there. He had no campaign staff at all. He had his brother and his sister, and, uh, and that was about it. So I started working to try to get some volunteers to come, and, and I would uh, dictate uh, letters, and, uh, and it, it was amazing. I mean, he would have letters from people from California with a dollar bill in there donated to his campaign. And it, you know, it, was, it was really fascinating that he could attract so many people from out of state. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, tried to put together as best we could uh, a campaign for him and to bring some other people in. And, and interestingly enough, the, uh, the Democratic Party the, Travis Stewart was the executive director of the Democratic Party, and uh, we felt that uh, that the, uh, the, the that the Democrats around the state were in pretty serious shape with a guy like Callaway on the ticket, because Callaway had, had won the race for Congress uh, uh, two years before, and uh, and was a pretty potent political figure. Uh, so it was decided that. We would hold uh, district, congressional district rallies, and we would invite uh, Maddox to attend. Uh, but he would not be the main speaker. The congressman would be the main speaker. And so that, that uh, worked out pretty good because it, at least it didn't, Democrats didn't get angry with their candidate because he didn't say anything. He was there shaking hands, which he did very well. He was very good at that. Uh, so, uh, in the end, uh, the Democrats were were fairly united uh, for Maddox against Callaway, and uh, although Callaway, as you know, won mm -hmm. won the election or got the most votes, so I don't know uh, I don't know how to explain the the Maddox campaign except it was uh, Maddox and is Pontiac and up and down the streets and and uh, and it was people behind the scenes that, that were working hard to uh, to try to prove to people that he wouldn't be as bad as they might have thought. Mm -hmm. Because he had the image of with the pickaxe. Yes, the pickaxe handle. And and he still does, <laughs> and he doesn't deserve. You know, that was bad, and he didn't. You know, he he would never say that it was bad, but it was bad and. But he was a better person than that. He was a decent person. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was a good person. Mm -hmm. He he uh, he did a lot of good things for people, and and I I can say that I, you know, admire him for that. And probably I I guess um, that was also his appeal, um, because that image also was of him protecting his property, and that's what a lot of people saw. Well, that's true. But also he he was for the downtrodden. And the uh, and the poor guy in prison, and the family of the guy in prison, and the guy on welfare, you know, that uh, that worked hard and, or couldn't get a job. Or, uh, Julian Bond told me one time that he thought that, uh, you know, Senator Bond, mm -hmm. uh, that that he was convinced that that Lester Maddox was really, really for poor people. 
and I think that's probably true. Hmm. The election goes to the legislature. Can you describe that process a little bit and from your perspective? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, the, 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 uh, the general election was, uh, was, you know, just uh, not very much. You had two candidates who thought alike, talked alike. Uh, Callaway was a little more sophisticated and could, could couch his words a little more civil uh, than Maddox. Well, the only issue really was uh, over a debate. Maddox wanted to debate Callaway, and Callaway didn't want to do it because he, uh, he realized, you know, that Maddox is so unpredictable, there's no telling what he might do to, to cause Callaway to lose votes. But finally it became so, uh, such an issue in the media that uh, they agreed to debate. And they had, uh, I think, three. Uh, and they all were just uh, shouting matches and, uh, because there was, not, there was very little they could talk. They, accusations is what, is what I guess you could say. Uh, they accused each other of all these things. But when it got to, to election day, uh, Maddox went off to a very early lead and was very comfortable in, uh, and his supporters were very comfortable that he was going to win. Uh, but uh, when, when DeKalb County finally came in, that was the Republican area at the time, uh, Callaway had overtaken him and had, uh, had, had taken the lead and had amassed the most votes. I think it was like 16,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, so right in Georgia, now I guess we should talk about that, <laughs> right in Georgia was a group of unsatisfied people who, want, who didn't want Callaway or Maddox, so they wrote in the name of, uh, of Governor Arnold, mm -hmm. who, who did not ask them not to. So that, that made it a deadlock, and uh, they got like 51,000 write-in votes, which put it into the General Assembly. Well, immediately following the election, there were several lawsuits, and uh, and th they wanted uh, a new election, they wanted this, they wanted that. Uh, but it went to the legislature and Maddox, uh, because of, of the Democrats in the legislature, uh, finally emerged victorious and, and became governor. Mm -hmm. Through this period, um, how did you support yourself ostensibly? Were you being paid by the party? Or how did that work at that time, if you were sort of an operative for the party? Well, uh, uh, it, it, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, sp I lost a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, you know, it, they, they would do expenses and things like that. Okay. And, uh, and, and somebody, you know, uh, uh, I think there, there were individuals who, who chunked in and uh, and I did get some pay, mm -hmm. but not a lot. Uh -huh. Probably more than I was worth. <laughs> well, because this is a question that that I haven't asked you before. But how did how did folks like you who are back room the back room boys, right? Yeah. At, at times like this during during campaigns, especially when things were sort of up in the air, how that how that worked? How, I mean, how you financially? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, David Gambrell, was, was, uh, who later became a United States Senator, was, uh, was a treasurer of, uh, of the Carter campaign. Mm -hmm. and, and David would, you know, give me some okay. money from time to time when they had it. Uh -huh. You know, but I, I was not on a fixed salary. Okay. Uh, and, you know, Craig, you look back over and, you know, it's crazy, but, but things like that happen, I guess. Right. <laughs> It makes me. It just makes me think that people who are involved in it are involved with it because they really love to do it. Well, that's true. Yeah. You know, you get it gets in your blood, mm -hmm. I guess. So Maddox sweeps in to the governorship, and he had a lot of people scared right up front. But he also had a pretty interesting inaugural address. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, well let me say this to you uh, first. 
uh, election day. Election day, I went over to the Capitol. This is the legislative election day. Mm -hmm. Down to the governor's office, got me a chair, took it up to the floor of the House of Representatives where they were to meet and vote, sat it down there, and, and plunked myself in it to watch history. Well, I got a tap on the shoulder, and it was a it was one of my secretary from the governor's office who who said uh, and I was on leave of absence, who said, uh, "Mr. Maddox is on the telephone. He'd like to talk to you." So I go down and to the telephone, and and he is at the Henry Grady Hotel, which was his headquarters, and asked me if I'd come over there. So I went over, and uh, he was there, and Ms. Maddox was there, and so she. Uh, she excused herself, and he said, okay, what do we do now? So I said, well, you want to be somewhere near the Capitol during the vote. And, uh, of course, we didn't know what time the vote would come up. So there are a lot of, a lot of uh, resolutions to do this, to do that, and to have a new election and everything. So I took him over to the office of the uh, state auditor and sat him down there by television, and he could watch the proceedings. And uh, and finally, when uh, when he was uh, when he became governor, when they voted him governor, uh, he went upstairs and uh, and and addressed the general assembly. Uh, Maddox never used uh, prepared texts. He wrote his speeches on the uh, back of his. Maddox country signs, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So he never used prepared text. But I had I had told him that he needed to say a few words, you know. And and right, I remember as I as I remember the first line was, "My heart is full." And then he went on to say how much he appreciated them, and and uh, and then a few words about or his words, like you know, I have no no friends to favor and no enemies to punish. And then he was, went down and got sworn in as governor. Well, we had already prepared his inaugural address. Uh, Walter Brooks uh, and uh, Bill Burson and I had worked on it for at least a couple of weeks. And uh, we, uh, we had already let him see it uh, and, and, you know, review it. And he did make, you know, a couple of corrections. But by and large, he used that uh, that speech uh, as as it was intended. Now, we had very carefully calculated what we thought he should say in order to allay the fears of some of the people in the state uh, who 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 feared him, and particularly the the business and political community. Uh, we wanted to to assure them that there'd be no violence and that he would you know conduct the state's business as it should be, and that sort of thing. And as it so happened, the, the speech was, uh, you know, it was very, very well received all over the world. I mean, we've got headlines from Paris, France, saying that this guy is, uh, you know, is going to do wonderful things, and we all were proud of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maddox comes into office, and has one of the, well, I should let you tell this. Describe how his, in retrospect and at the time, how his role as governor surprised people. Well, I think that. Uh, as in people in the, who were, who were people in the Democratic Party, the people who were afraid. Well, that's a difficult question. <laughs> I think, I think that, uh, I think that first of all, that, that the, powers that be in Georgia politics wanted desperately for him to succeed. And they were willing to do whatever they could in order to, to help him. Uh, I don't think any of them, uh, any of the United States senators or former governors or party leaders uh, ever did or said anything that, that would uh, embarrass or or hamper uh, Governor Maddox. Uh, he was quite a businessman, and he understood finances. I remember that one of the first things that he did was inherit a budget 
that we call the Santa Claus budget because it was prepared by the outgoing governor who had no reason to worry about what the state could afford and couldn't afford. So he was sort of like Santa Claus, just giving out gifts to all of these departments. Mm -hmm. And it became necessary for, for Governor Maddox to do something about that because we literally could not afford that budget without a tax increase. So, uh, so he very carefully went through the budget and worked, worked very diligently on, on making sure that we live within our means, at least during that first period. You see, when in Georgia, in the old days, at the end of the primary election, you had your governor because there was no Republican opposition. In this case, there was a Republican opponent, and so you couldn't start working really on budgets and that sort of thing until you won the election. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have the, the benefit of those three or four months there to, to get in with your own uh, on your budget. So the, the outgoing governor did that uh, 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 of necessity. And so when uh, when when Maddox got it, uh, you know he 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 had a problem on his hand. But uh, again, uh, people uh, you know people knowledgeable people uh, helped him uh, uh, erase some of the expenditures that uh, or cut the budget so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, one was uh, one was uh, Wilson Wilkes Flicker Wilkes, who was the budget uh, man under uh, the former outgoing governor. And one was uh, was B. Brooks, who was who had been a, a very parsimonious uh, budget man when he worked with Governor Vanderbilt. So those two and others helped him get that fixed right off the bat. And then he was able to go into some of the things that that he wanted to do, uh, but he had only a few days. In other words, uh, uh, you know, it's customary for the governor to make a state of the state address. Uh, and, a, and a budget address mm -hmm. all in one. But I persuaded the legislative leaders to allow Governor Maddox to do it twice, to make a state of the state and then give him more time to, to work on the budget aspects of, of that first year of his administration. So I don't know if that answered your question, but, but that's, uh, that's the way it was. Tell us a little bit about Maddox's People Day. People today, well, uh, in his in his inaugural address, uh, at his uh, at his request, we we put in a we put in a, a portion there promising the people to participate in their government, and actually the People's Day uh, came as a, as a result of the backroom boys who used that phrase, uh, which which. Later, people call little people today, but the, Maddox didn't like that because he didn't think those people were little. He thought they were great people. But anyway, he uh, he had on, uh, I believe it was the second and fourth Wednesdays of his uh, his term, he had what he called People Today, uh, during which uh, people could walk in from off the street and talk to their governor and tell them their problem, tell him their problem. And he would have uh, officials there to say, well, now, if you got a problem with your welfare, you go see this fellow over here and this fellow over here. Uh, and they were very, very successful and very popular. And then he had, uh, on Sunday afternoons from time to time, he had People's Day at the governor's mansion because he thought that people ought to see that. This was the new mansion. This mm -hmm. is the, the first time that he was the first governor that ever lived in that mansion. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted people to see the mansion, and they'd give guided tours, and people would show up, and again talk about their problems. But there were long lines of people, real long lines of people. In fact, one of the one of the things that that is most remarkable was the time that the three escaped convicts came and turned themselves in to call attention to the bad treatment they were getting in one of the prison camps, and uh, it was it was like that, you know, people and visiting and talking to the governor. Was it that episode in particular that helped bring up the problem of the prisons and, and the parole board issues and that kind of thing that was going on? That, in was, that, that was part of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, actually, Governor Maddox was, uh, he was very aware of the pardon and parole board situation mm -hmm. before he went into office. Mm -hmm. And he, that was one of his, uh, that was one of his objectives, is to do something about how pardons and paroles were issued in the state of Georgia. And so he selected as, uh, as an appointee, his first appointee, uh, Jack Partain, who is a very interesting Georgian. Uh, Jack, uh, Jack was a retired military colonel, I think army colonel, and he, uh, he got to know Lester Maddox uh, in a very unique way, which I think really points out the personality of Jack Partain. Uh, when Maddox was running for mayor of Atlanta, one of the civic groups had invited the mayor at the time in to speak, and the mayor at the time came in and spoke. Well, Jack Partain felt that was unfair. He didn't know Lester Maddox, but he felt that if that guy, if the mayor could come in and speak, then his opponent should come in and speak. So Maddox became very fond of Jack for standing up like that, and he, he looked at Jack as being a very uh, upright person, which he was. And, uh, and so he put Jack Partain over at the Pardon and Parole Board uh, and ask him to find out what's going on and see what's needed to straighten that place out. And, and, and Mr. Partain did, and uh, the result was a, uh, a, a, an abrupt but, but sweeping change in the way that pardons and paroles were issued in the state of Georgia. Hmm. You left Maddox in, I believe, March of 1968. Somewhere in there. To become was this to become regional director of FEMA? Well, it, yes, it was. Uh, it was called the Office of Emergency Preparedness mm -hmm. at that time, and I was appointed uh, by President Johnson, uh, and I served there until uh, and, uh, until oh, almost I guess midway through Nixon's first term. I can't remember now exactly how long it was, but it was. Uh, I guess close to two years. I'm not, I'd have to think about that a little. How and why did you make that switch? Well, I had, I, I knew Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when President Johnson came down to Georgia uh, during a, uh, a hurricane uh, down on the coast, mm -hmm. uh, I was asked to help, you know, with the arrangements and that sort of thing, which I did. And uh, President Johnson uh, asked me several questions about politics. You know, what are, what are my chances here, and what's this, and what's that, and what's the other? Well, <clears throat> that was in, uh, I guess, 64, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, the, uh, he, he had as a director of that agency in Washington, uh, Governor Price Daniel from Texas. Uh, who had been a United States Senator and went home to run and won the race for governor and then served out his term and went with John. But anyway, uh, I got a call one day saying, uh, we'd like to talk to you about uh, this job uh, that we want you to fill in, in, in uh, Georgia. Uh, and I said, well, fine, I'll be glad to talk, to about, it, talk about it. But by this time, uh, frankly, I was I was just burned out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Maddox was speaking. I was responsible for his speeches. I didn't write them, but I was resp I wrote some of them. Uh, the group wrote a lot of them because of the big ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just you know I felt like a change would be nice, so I accepted the position and became the regional director of the Office of Emergency Preparedness, which is a little bit different mm -hmm. from FEMA mm -hmm. in that uh, it was geared toward reaction to nuclear attack. And it had to, do, it had to deal with, uh, with the problems of uh, survival. Mm -hmm. And one of the responsibilities was to, to help these states uh, devise their own plans to react to that sort of disaster, and we did that. But later on, 
uh, uh, President Johnson uh, decided that he wanted to use the agency uh, for what he called federal-state relations. So we became the arm of the White House in these areas, and we worked directly with governors uh, on problems that the states had with the federal government. We had seminars and, and uh, brought in uh, uh, department people and uh, worked very well. All right. When we left off talking before the break, we were talking a little bit about when you became the regional director of the Office of Emergency Preparedness. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that entailed and any memories with regard to that? Well, the Office of Emergency Preparedness, is, uh, as I've said, uh, function as a guard against nuclear attack. And the responsibilities of the office, uh, the responsibility was to be able to continue to govern after a nuclear attack. And the, sta the country was divided into eight different regions. And within each reason, region, there were facilities to protect uh, government officials uh, from the after effects of a nuclear attack, and also to keep uh, current data on the availability of resources. So the, the office uh, had that primary responsibility. Uh, but also it had the responsibility to uh, work with state and cities, state governments and city governments around the country, to help them devise their own plan for, t for reacting to a nuclear attack and, and to attempt to bring the two together, the cities, and well, the three, the cities, the counties, and, and the federal government and the state. Uh, so in a, in a unified response. So that required uh, the agency to train state governments and local governments in uh, how to respond to that situation and to educate them on the, uh, on the uh, aftermath of, of a nuclear explosion and, and what can be done to preserve the people and the, and the resources. But later on, uh, President Johnson decided that since we were uh, in the midst of the states, that uh, he would like for us to expand our uh, uh, activities to include uh, federal state relations in those areas, and we did. Mm -hmm. And he th then they changed the name of the agency to the Office of Emergency Preparedness and Federal State Relations. So we worked with governors on problems that they might have with the federal government and how to solve those problems and, and specific problems, you know, uh, that, that apply only to them. They might have a problem with the highway department or something, uh, Federal Roads Bureau and that sort of thing. And so we worked with that. And it was very effective. We had, uh, we had seminars for, uh, for <coughs> government officials that were conducted by our agency where we brought in the experts from all of these various programs to get them familiar with how it works. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it was a very good agency. Uh, when President Carter uh, went into office in uh, 1977, uh, or shortly thereafter, he, he changed the name of the organization to FEMA, okay. Federal Emergency Management Agency, and, and did uh, something with civil defense. Now, when we when o OEP was in, a, uh, was in existence, uh, there also was an agency called Civil Defense. And as you can well imagine, who, who thought that agency really believed it had the same responsibilities that we did. So you can see that there was a turf problem there, and, mm -hmm. and you can understand why uh, President Carter figured out, well, we don't need all of this, so he made it into one agency. Mm -hmm. And that's today's FEMA. Okay. We handled a lot of... Uh, <coughs> a lot of emergencies, uh, uh, hurricanes and tornado reaction and that sort of thing, but that was not our primary responsibility at the time. Mm -hmm. It mostly centered on the nuclear yes. threat. When did you leave that position? 
Well, I uh, I was there uh, for a oh, year and a half during the Nixon administration. Okay. And then uh, and then they uh, suddenly decided, I guess, that uh, they didn't need me anymore. So I left there and uh, came back into state government. Where did you go to in state? Well, government? I'll tell you. I was the uh, I was the executive assistant to the lieutenant governor of Georgia for one year, uh, George T. Smith. Worked with him and the Senate. And then made uh, probably the worst career move I ever made. I ran for a seat on the Public Service Commission. And I came in a close second which probably is the greatest thing that ever happened to me because that put me then out into the world where I, you know, the corporate world where I had to bust it to succeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I became a corporate official there for a number of years until I retired. And then I opened my own business. Now where did you, what was the corporate, what business did you go to from there? Well, I worked with uh, Hoffman LaRoche. Okay which was a, the world's largest uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing company at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, in their Office of Public Affairs. Okay. And toured the country uh, working with, with government officials and legislators on issues of the day. Primarily the, uh, that, that great war over the substitution of generic drugs for brand name drugs. Interesting, and it was a, it was a it was a really a, a battle between uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers and doctors on the same side versus generic drug manufacturers and pharmacists on the other side, and that went on for several years. And uh, then then I uh, was offered a better position with Hospital Corporation of America, where I worked until my retirement. Uh, from there, and uh, and was in the healthcare industry for all those years. And did you say that you went into business at some point? Yes. Yeah. Well, following that, I, I went in. I formed my own corporation, my own business. Uh, I had uh, forty uh, people, uh, contractual people in forty different states, and w our primary objective was to uh, show big corporations how to market their services and products uh, to government. And uh, we had a number of, of big, big clients and, uh, and it was a wonderful job and it was a wonderful, uh, it was a wonderful thing to do because uh, most, most large corporations, as you probably know, have a staff for everything. They had marketing staffs that reached out and, and, uh, into almost everything, and, but, but nobody really seemed to know how to approach government uh, programming and, and government uh, procedures and, and government purchasing. So we uh, coached, I guess is the word, mm -hmm. these, these corporations on how they can use, uh, the, how they can sell their product to government. For example, uh, one of our clients was in the, uh, in the distance learning uh, business and we were able to get them contracts in several places simply by introducing them to, to the state purchasing people and, and have them demonstrate what their product really was. And it wasn't like taking somebody to lunch or, mm -hmm. or buying a few martinis. It was it's showing them uh, hands-on how to operate this stuff and how it worked. And, and that was, you know, it was very successful. So it was, it was almost like a more brass tax version of lobbying. Your, 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 well, it could be, I your, guess, called lobbying. We, you know, we uh, uh, actually didn't register as lobbyists because we were marketing mm -hmm. people and, uh, and didn't do uh, all of that with, with the legislature. Sometimes we would find it necessary to talk to governors about funding uh, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, it was just, uh, it was teaching clients how to lobby, I guess is the word, or the words mm -hmm. to best describe it. Well, and as we know, through all this period, you were interested and involved to one extent or another 
in Georgia politics. So I want to get back to a Georgia politics question. Okay. How did Carl Sanders lose the gubernatorial race in 1970 to your old boss, Jimmy Carter? Jimmy Carter. Well, Carl Sanders was my old boss, too. Yeah. Well, yeah. He, he was my first old boss. So you would, we would think there is some special insight here. And I well, would, I don't know, really. Uh, 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 Governor Sanders uh, uh, in that race was, uh, took what he called the high road. Uh, Governor Sanders refused to uh, respond to any of the many charges that the Carter people uh, uh, put out against him. They, you know, he, he was, uh, you remember the term cufflinks Carl, mm -hmm. they, they used that because Governor Sanders once had made when he was governor uh, some cufflinks that uh, bore the, his, his name but also the uh, outline of the state of Georgia that, was, that, that, that they handed out to industrialists and, and uh, new business prospects and that sort of thing. And, and, then, uh, and then the, uh, the Carter campaign uh, uh, painted uh, Sanders as a silk stocking lawyer who got rich off of his term as governor, which uh, I think is, is not true. I think probably Carter was richer than Sanders at the time. Uh, and also they used a lot of the, uh, they used a lot of racial things. Like they they uh, put out a picture of uh, Governor Sanders, who was very close to the Hawks, Atlanta Hawks management, uh, Tom Cousins and others. Uh, the picture was uh, Sanders sitting there uh, as a spectator with his suit and tie on at a ball game, and and the players pouring champagne over his head uh, after they had won a spot in the playoffs. And that was circulated all over the state, you know, uh, uh, which I assume they meant to uh, 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 to uh, suggest that Sanders was, you know, uh, very close to black people, which uh, is well, true. You know, he was he was close to uh, to the uh, black leadership in the state of Georgia, and uh, uh, and also they used the fact that he uh, helped. Uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson in his campaign in 1964. So it was a mean-spirited uh, campaign, but, but Sanders ignored all that. And even his best advisors told him that he had to, you know, he had to start responding, that it was beginning to hurt him, but he refused to do it. So on election day, he was defeated. And uh, it ended his political career. Would you say that <clears throat> Carter maybe took a, a page from Maddox in this? I think I really, well, I will say this. Another thing that they used against uh, Sanders was that, uh, the Carter people, was that he refused to allow George Wallace to speak mm -hmm. in Georgia. Uh, and uh, the situation was this. Uh, Wallace was invited by a convention to speak at the Aquarama at Jekyll Island, which is a state-owned property. Uh, it's a state park. And the local NAACP had uh, requested uh, a permit to march. And then uh, uh, after that debate was going on, whether or not you could do that on a state property, uh, the, uh, the Klan also applied for a permit to demonstrate. So, so Sanders' reaction was, that, well, it's a state facility. We don't want a war down there. So I'm just going to refuse to, to let him speak on a state property. Then they moved the, the location of the speech to an armory over in Brunswick. Well, the same thing happened, you know. So, so they, they uh, accused Sanders of not letting George Wallace speak, and that hurt him some. Uh, and Jimmy Carter promised to allow Wallace to speak if he were elected governor. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, undercover things that really hurt uh, Carl Sanders. Uh, he, he was a good governor, and most people will tell you that. He did a lot of good things for the state, but unfortunately it was during a period when uh, Georgia had just not matured racially uh, to the point where it is today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So Carter used the transformation or transformed himself for that campaign into more of a segregationist. Or well, a, I would. Well, how you would know, you characterize I, it? I, I don't. I, I, it's hard to describe. Uh, you know, politics and campaigning uh, both are funny things. Uh, most of the time, when you use those uh, tactics, uh, the, you isolate the candidate so that he can say, well, you know, I didn't have anything to do with that. And, you know, and honestly be truthful. But uh, it's done. Mm -hmm. It's done by the, by the campaign. It's, I remember Bill Pope, who was one of his PR guys, once made the statement that, uh, that they ran that in campaign and that's how they won. And that was, that's in Peter Bourne's book mm -hmm. that he wrote uh, in the title with Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. And so the staff knew that. Now, what Carter knew, I don't know. But it implied that he was appealing to the Maddox-type voter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? It makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Since that point, um, when you came back to Georgia, or when, when you came back to state politics for, for a time and then left to go into the private sector, um, whose campaigns have you advised and what are some memories of these? Well, a number of, uh, a number, mm -hmm. you know, it's... Uh, what stands out for you in those? In, in, the, in the campaign? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when I was called upon to assist uh, it usually was in a capacity of, uh, of uh, uh, interpretation of polls and uh, how, to, uh, how to overcome uh, shortcomings in and, uh, and, and the campaign and, and that sort of thing. I never managed one, mm -hmm. uh, didn't want to, but uh, uh, there were there were several that, that stand out in my memory. Uh, George T. Smith was one. Uh, George T. Smith was uh, uh, was in a runoff with the incumbent lieutenant governor, and Governor Sanders called me and asked me if I would go to the campaign and, and help him, and I did. And he was able to turn around uh, several major uh, uh, factions uh, within the Democratic Party to uh, to win that election. Mm -hmm. uh, it was close in the primary, but he won handily in the runoff. Uh, and he was, uh, he was uh, you know, a good, good lieutenant governor and, and a good, very good person. And then there's state legislators. I do that mm -hmm. all the time. In fact, I just did it uh, last year. I was helping a couple of people that were running. And, and I'm no expert, you know, but, but when they ask, you know, I don't mind giving them my opinion. Mm -hmm. which probably is worth what it costs them. <laughs> um, you touched, well, you just mentioned that y you were helping out in George T. Smith and his lieutenant governor's race. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask you about a couple of different things um, leading to my question about Zell Miller. I have mm -hmm. a question here about Zell Miller and your relationship with him over the years, but maybe leading into that, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the office of lieutenant governor and the, the role of that office in Georgia politics and what that has meant through the years, because I know that you've had some interest in that office as, well, it's an interesting part of Georgia politics, but yes. um, I, I want to get your take on that. On the office of lieutenant governor? Yeah. Well, as you know, the lieutenant governor presides over the mm -hmm. Senate. Uh, he appoints all the committees. He selects the committee chairman. If he chooses, he can rule the Georgia Senate with an iron hand, which some of them did and some of them didn't. Uh, Miller was, a, was an excellent presiding officer, for example. Lester Maddox didn't care for legislative politics because he never understood it. There's a lot of give and take and camaraderie you know, I fight mm -hmm. you today, uh, tomorrow we're the best friends and on the same side. Maddox never really understood that. But Zell Miller was excellent in building coalitions. And he got through the uh, 
through the Georgia Senate just about anything that, that he supported. Uh, there's always been, and I guess there always will be, a feud between the House and the Senate. That's a foregone conclusion. So, uh, you know, and you have to be, as Lieutenant Governor, you have to be good at dealing with the other side of the legislature as well, uh, in addition to being able to, uh, to persuade your senators on some issue, you got to also be able to overcome the opposition in the other chamber. Uh, so that led to the very famous uh, debates between uh, Zell Miller as Lieutenant Governor and Speaker Tom Murphy. Mm -hmm. Both were iron-willed. Both were strong advocates, and they they had fusses, you know, for as long as they both were in, were there, which was some 16 years. Mm -hmm. But yet they were very close personal friends, and that the public doesn't see that. But to get back to your question, uh, uh, as I see the office of lieutenant governor, it's probably, it is the most powerful legislative office in the state, in any state, if they preside over the Senate. And in order to get anything through the, uh, the legislature, you must have the support of the lieutenant governor as well as the speaker. Mm -hmm. One good example of that is, is Miller's lottery bill. You know, he proposed a lottery bill for several years before the Speaker of the House of Representatives would let it come up for a vote. But when it became apparent that, that the people of Georgia would actually approve a constitutional amendment, amendment setting up the lottery, the Speaker let, let the House vote. The House voted, passed the Senate bill, and then, then Miller got his lottery. Mm -hmm. Now, Miller had been an assistant to Lester Maddox when Maddox was governor. Right. When Maddox became lieutenant governor, I'm trying to contrast the differences between Maddox's style and Miller, who followed right after. Well, there was quite a bit of difference in the style. Mm -hmm. Now, Maddox was very combative with the governor. Yes. Did he turn around and that was that combative style also apparent in his work in the Senate and as part of the legislature as a whole? Uh, Maddox? Yeah. Ma well, Maddox was not combative in the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, he had, uh, the, uh, Jimmy Carter, who, who I have great respect for, you know, I like mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter. Uh, he's a good man and he's a, he was a good, good politician. But Jimmy Carter, I think, failed to realize when Maddox became lieutenant governor that Maddox was an independent cuss that you just couldn't push around. And so uh, Maddox's side of the story is that Carter attempted to tell him who to appoint to what committees and what committee chairman should be appointed, as governors have normally always done. And that riled up Maddox, and it made him very, very angry. And his response to all of that was a, was a, a, a tough a statement that he made that got in all the press, and uh, and the next thing you know, those two are just uh, miles apart. Now, uh, Carter, before he left office, confessed that it probably was his fault because he failed to understand, you know, Maddox, and and failed to overcome the problem. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether it it dates back to their 1966 race. I have seen. Uh, uh, Governor uh, Maddox, on several occasions, uh, talked badly of, of Carter because Carter made a statement years ago, years and years ago, that was critical of Maddox and uh, and that he should not have been elected governor and he didn't deserve to be elected and and that sort of thing. But uh, I was hopeful, as as a friend to both, that somewhere over the years they would shake hands and and be friends. Uh, but I don't think that ever happened. Mm -hmm. Back to Zell Miller. Um, you've known him most of your life. Since I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. That's many years ago, Craig. <laughs> Tell us something about him that maybe isn't apparent from his pretty well-documented public documented Zell public Miller. Career. Well, <clears throat> when I first Zell Mil met Zell Miller, we both were in high school. And as a matter of fact, uh, Zell Miller is, is uh, 
one of the reasons that I went to Young Harris College. And when I was young, I had this urge, I guess is the word, to be a minister. And I was a, I'd had a good, good basketball career in high school, all star and all that stuff. And I wanted to play basketball, but I wanted to go to a place where I could make up my mind whether or not I really wanted to be a minister. And Young Harris College was just across the mountain there, and it was a Methodist school. Methodist Church was very much in, uh, connected with Young Harris. So I decided to go there. And Zell Miller and I became very close friends in the, from the very beginning. We both belonged to the same debating society. We, we shared a lot of campus activities together. And I guess you could say that uh, we were best friends. Uh, but somewhere along the line, I got more interested in basketball than I did in the ministry. And as I like to say, uh, there was a battle there, and God won because I never became a minister. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, since that day, we've been very close friends, and, and I have, I've been a supporter of his uh, through thick and thin, and always will be. Uh, I'm very proud of him as a person. I'm very proud of him as a politician. I think he was a great governor. I think he gave this state more than it deserved, and I think he was a great United States senator who kept his word when he said, when I get to Washington, I'm not going to represent any party. I'm not going to be partisan. And that's exactly what he did. Now, it didn't serve him well in some areas, but uh, that's the kind of person he is, and that's the kind of person I admire. Now, specifically, if you have any questions that I can answer about him, I'd be happy to do it. Do you think he's misunderstood? I do. Yes, I do. I. Uh, I, I can say to you, uh, in all honesty, that, uh, that I have become very disappointed in some of the Georgia's politicians who didn't come to his rescue when those talking heads up there in New York were condemning him for being a Maddox person, a racist, and all of that, because he's not. And you can ask Thurbert Baker. He appointed Thurbert Baker as Attorney General of the state of Georgia. You can ask Michael Thurman. He appointed Michael Thurman as labor commissioner in the state of Georgia. You can ask Al Scott. He appointed Al Scott. Uh, Al Scott, as far as I know, was the first black department head in the history of the state. So he, he was not a racist, and yet they didn't say a word. They didn't, they didn't say, that's, no, that's wrong. They didn't say anything. You can ask John Lewis. Mm -hmm. uh, Zell Miller endorsed John Lewis for Congress when he ran against White's Fowler and walked the streets of Atlanta with him. But you didn't hear from John Lewis when they were accusing him of being a racist. So all of that disappoints me. Now, is he misunderstood? Uh, I, I guess maybe he is, but should he be misunderstood? I don't think so. I just think that, that uh, a lot of people failed to speak out for him when they should have. Do you think that question that just comes to my head, do you think that that's part of something that's dogged Georgia politicians who go to Washington down the years? Do you think they've had an image problem to contend with? Well, I don't think so in, in recent times. Uh, you know, and it used to be in the United States Senate and in the Congress that if you were from the South or you were from Georgia, you were, you know, put, you were, uh, identified as, uh, as one type of individual uh, when you were, could have been many types of individual. Mm -hmm. I mean, Senator Russell, for example, most powerful senator who ever lived, and probably who will ever live, uh, was classified as a Southerner and therefore not acceptable to the rest of the country. Well, I think he was very acceptable to the rest of the country. I just think the rest of the country didn't understand the circumstances. Mm -hmm. And you can't be powerful in Washington, and you can't be the, the, the finest senator who ever lived, and you can't be effective in your job, and you can't do things for this country if you can't get elected. And back in those days, if you didn't take that position, you know, our way, or whatever they called it, our way of life, 
If you didn't take that position, you wouldn't be in Washington, so you couldn't be powerful. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't be the best senator who ever lived. And you couldn't be admired as he was by Georgia people. And so you were classified. You were put in that, uh, put in that arena, and that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. Not that way anymore. You can't do that anymore. That's how much politics uh, has changed over the years. That leads to the, that almost answers the next question I have. Describe from your point of view the differences you see in Georgia politics today as opposed to Georgia politics 40 years ago. What has changed and what hasn't? Well, you know, the, the entire facet has changed. You now have two parties. You used to have only two parties in the, in the Democratic Party. That's, uh, that's the uh, Talmadge Party and the Rivers Party. And now you have a Republican Party and, and a Democratic Party. And as over the years, as, as Georgians have become uh, angry, I guess is the word, the best word, with the National Democratic Party, you see more and more Democrats becoming either Republicans or Independents. And, and that has brought about a brand new uh, day in Georgia politics. Uh, no longer can the Democrats depend on winning. Uh, they now have, have been taught, I guess, the hard way that they can be whipped, and they have been. And, and unless things change, uh, it, it could be that way for many, many years. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that, uh, that the Republican Party in Georgia has been able to build up a bench of candidates that far surpass what the Democrats have offered. And I think they've done that through training candidates, picking good candidates, and uh, teaching them how to win. I think the Democrats just allow people to qualify uh, without any direction. And then somebody wins the primary, and then they lose the, uh, the election because they have not campaigned properly. And you have, to, you have to work at that. You can't just say, I'm a Democrat, I'm going to win, because that's not true anymore. So there's been a great change, and there'll probably be even more change. Georgia politics is just full of really colorful, interesting people. Yeah, well, you can say that. <laughs> Who's on your list, your short list, the Bob short list of uh, your mentors and your heroes in Georgia politics? My heroes in Georgia politics. Well, uh, during my short life, I would have to say that uh, probably at the top of the list would be Ernest Vandiver. I was there when Ernest Vandiver made the decisions that he made regarding keeping the University of Georgia open and the schools open, and it took, that's probably the greatest act of courage that this state has known in many, many years. In fact, Jimmy Carter once said that. Uh, he was faced with that decision knowing that most of uh, the legislature and most of his friends and almost all Georgians uh, would not approve of what he did. And, and in, uh, uh, you know, when you look back on it, I think you could truthfully say that that probably ended his uh, political career because he ran for, for the United States Senate uh, later and was defeated, and I'm sure that's because of that. Uh, Ernest Vander is one. Carl Sanders is one. Uh, Carl Sanders uh, has helped Georgia turn the corner. Uh, in economic growth and, and national recognition when he was governor of this state. Uh, he was the first governor who actively supported the national uh, Democratic uh, presidents, Kennedy and, and Johnson. And, from, and because he did, he got a lot of assistance for this state that we were unaccustomed to get. But more than that, he, he sort of moderated the political tone in this state. He was not uh, extremely conservative. He was not extremely liberal. Uh, he was a moderate, he was a middle-of-the-road kind of guy 
that, uh, that did a very effective job for the state. So Ernie Vanderbilt and, and Carl Sander. Then, then there was George Busby, mm -hmm. who I admired greatly, uh, George Busby. George Busby was the kind of guy that you really wanted to help because he was a nice guy. And he also was a very, very effective governor. He brought the world to, to Georgia. He brought industry here from all over the country, all over the world and the country. And he, uh, he also uh, opened up international banking. And look what he did for the Atlanta airport. He realized that without a good airport with international flights, we would never be the economic stronghold we are today. So I admired George Busby. I also admired Zell Miller, another courageous guy. I mean, who can imagine? One time Zell Miller, I remember, I'll always remember this. We were coming back from a, some sort of function they had for him down in, uh, down in South Georgia, Senator Gillis and, and Senator uh, uh, Kennedy, Joe Kennedy. And we were, back on, we were coming back on an airplane, he and I and the pilot, and he said, uh, I want to run something by you. And I said, okay. He liked to do that. He liked to run things by people. I said, I want to run something by you. And he said, uh, I think I'm going to come out for a lottery. A lot of these states have got them. Florida's got them, and they're taking our money south. What do you think of that? I said, well, politically, I think that you're going to have every minister in the state of Georgia on your case every Sunday morning. And you're going to have all of these, uh, these uh, very religious people on your case. And uh, if you can overcome that, then, you know, I think it's probably a good idea. So he reached in his pocket. And I'll tell you about Zell Miller. If you, ever, if, Zell, if you ever tell Zell Miller anything and he reaches in his pocket and he takes out an envelope and writes it on there, you can bet he's serious about it. So he reached in his pocket. He, he brought out this uh, envelope, the results of a poll that he had had taken about a lottery for Georgia. And it was like 68, 69 percent of the people favored the lottery. And I said, well, you know, that's your answer. And so he, uh, he had the uh, courage to introduce that. And you know, when you think about it, and this is serious political talk now, when you think about it, I don't know today exactly how many students are on this campus or in college in Georgia that benefit from that Hope Scholarship. But it's up in the hundreds of thousands. I guess maybe approaching a million, I don't know. But all of that because he had the courage to, uh, to fight for a lottery. Uh, plus all the other things, you know, the, the, uh, the, the kindergarten. And that now is going down, what, to three-year-olds. Uh, that's made possible by that lottery. A lot of this uh, technology in the classrooms financed by the lottery. So uh, it's been, uh, he's, he's a very thoughtful visionary person. I can tell you that, uh, that he had been in office uh, January, February, almost three months in 1991 when uh, I went with him to, uh, to Raleigh, North Carolina, where he spoke to uh, a meeting of uh, Democrats. And he told those Democrats, and I still have a copy of the speech, exactly what he wrote in his book, The National Party No More. He told them how the Democratic Party had drifted away from its original ideals and what was going to happen. They didn't believe him then, and they don't believe him now. But, but that was right on. That was right on. And it, you can see it in this state, and you can see it in this country. There's got to be some, there's gotta be some uh, missionary work done by both parties to get this country back where it belongs. Anyone else on that short list? Well, let's see. Where, how, oh, well. You know, of course, Walter Brooks, B. Brooks will always be my hero. 
He was my mentor. He taught me a lot. Uh, he was a very close friend. He was a very intelligent man. And uh, Lord knows I miss him. Bill Burson, with whom I worked for several years in the same office. Uh, Bill Burson probably is the most intelligent person I've ever known. Bill Burson uh, was, is a graduate of the University of Georgia, Phi Beta Kappa at the University of Georgia, top of his class. He was a decorated war correspondent in, uh, in Korea. He was a tremendous reporter. He, uh, I love to tell the story about, uh, that Judge Brooks told me about, uh, Burson said that uh, Burson was covering the Capitol and when Herman Talmadge was governor, and he kept popping these questions at Talmadge that Talmadge didn't want an answer, didn't want to answer. And uh, finally Talmadge one day says, uh, B, who is that fellow to ask all those tough questions? And Brooks said, well, that's Bill Burson. He's a reporter with, with uh, UPI. And Talmadge says, hire him. He's smarter than we are. <laughs> and he was. And he was just a great fellow. And uh, I miss him too. Spent many an hour with Brooks and Burson creating prose for, or as Burson liked to say, walking around in another fellow's skull by writing speeches and, and uh, thinking. I guess that's about it. There are a lot of people that I, that I greatly admire, uh, a lot of state legislators. Well, let, me pose, let me pose it this way. Let me pose the same question in kind of a different way. Who of the people you've known who've occupied public office, who's unsung? Who's unsung? Well, of course, Burson is. Right. Burson, Burson is, uh, he never got uh, what he deserved out of public life. He was elected state treasurer, but they abolished his office, and, uh, and he ran for the United States Senate and was defeated. And, and you know, I think it's because, and we never talked about this, but I think it was because that he also embraced George Wallace after he had created such a fan base uh, among the minorities of this state. He had his war on hunger. He did welfare reform. Everybody uh, loved him for that. And, uh, well, not everybody, but you, you know what I mean. Uh, he, he just, he lost all that. And I think it was because he, uh, he came out as a big Wallace supporter. Uh, he's unsung. There are others. Uh, uh, B. Brooks was unsung. Uh, B. Brooks was an advisor and a thinker for several governors and, and would be today if he were still alive because he was that brilliant when it comes to, uh, to government and governing. Uh, Ellis Arnold was was not unsung during his day, but he lost all of that and he lost his race, uh, his uh, race for governor when he attempted to come back. So there, there are a lot of people who have done good work that they have not been given proper credit for, uh, but those come to mind quickest. If you could Here's the last kind of this question I'm going to ask. <laughs> if you could speak to a political science class here at UGA and tell them about one person in Georgia politics who they should look to the history of or look to as either a role model or somebody who is symbolic of Georgia history, uh, political history, who would that politician well, That's be? a tough question. Uh, it's a real tough question. But again, I would, I would say to you, George Busby. I would say George Busby. George Busby has, has created a record in the state that will be hard to beat. He was, uh, he was in the legislature for 18 years. He was chairman of the Appropriations Committee. He started off as chairman of the Appropriations Committee. He later became majority leader. He could have been speaker, but he chose not to run for speaker, to, to run for uh, governor, uh, which made 
it, the road easy for Tom Murphy to become speaker. Uh, he did so many wonderful things for the state of Georgia. Uh, but it's like I said before, you know, you just, you just want to help old George Busby because you like him. He's a good guy. He's a nice fellow. Uh, he would be uh, he would be one that I think that if you could emulate, you would be in good shape. Uh, I also failed to mention uh, earlier, and uh, on the top of my head, Liv, another person for whom I have the utmost respect is Joe Frank Harris uh, and Elizabeth, his his wife. They they were they are just top notch people, and Joe Frank, uh, you know, they called him Slow Frank, and they. Thought he didn't think he moved quick enough and that he was a little bit uh, slow and that, but don't believe all that. Joe Frank Harris was a good, good governor and, and a much, much better person. What are some of the untold stories of George Pol Georgia politics that you believe need telling? Mm. Again, that's a very, very good question. You know, when you get behind the scenes in, uh, in politics, you, you start getting into people's lives, and you, you don't always want to do that. Uh, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, let me, let me answer that by saying this. Some of the best characters that, that have been governors and politicians in the state, first of all, was Marvin Griffin, who was a great storyteller, a great... Uh, a great stump speaker, uh, he could uh, he could captivate a crowd and nothing flat. Uh, Marvin Griffin uh, used to cook a a meal called Perlu, and uh, several years ago, well, many years ago, I, I wrote uh, Governor Griffin a letter and asked him for the recipe, and he wrote me back, and I still have the letter. Uh, giving me a witty recipe to make Perlu. It's, it's fairly, you know, it's very simple, but, but his letter was so humorous that uh, I laughed so much that I forgot about making Perlu. But, but there's, there's things that, that there, there are idiosyncrasies uh, of people that, uh, that you'd like to tell, but you can't. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I don't know that there are any untold secrets that uh, should be mentioned, uh, Craig, uh, without, you know, revealing things that I shouldn't say. <laughs> Who will be the next governor of Georgia? The next governor of Georgia. You know, I have no idea. I would think that uh, on the Republican side, if Senator Isaacson, Johnny Isaacson, decides to come home and run, that he would be elected, because he is—he's uh, loved not only by Republicans but by many, many Democrats. So uh, Johnny Isaacson would be my first guess. Uh, I don't know who the Democratic uh, candidate might be. Uh, it, I know that several uh, uh, are looking at the race, but. Uh, I, I just I couldn't tell you who it might be, uh, but unless the Democrats can come up with a strong, strong candidate, uh, I think the Republicans will win again. When you look at, we have a Senate race this year. Uh, Senator Chambliss is running for re-election. He will be re-elected uh, if for no other reason. The Democrats have no candidates, and that's their problem. Uh, you've, you've, got to, you've got to put out candidates that can be elected. And, and you've got to put out candidates who can defeat an incumbent senator with a good record and one who's respected you know, around the state. No longer do you see much of this yellow dog stuff in either party. People are, people are switching back and forth. And so uh, it's going to be tough for, for a Democrat to win, I think. Now, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, they and as you have repeated, said the issues are come down to the schools and the roads in Georgia. Yeah, yeah. What else today is one of the great issues that we have to deal with? In Georgia? Yep. Well, you got taxes. You got taxes and you got uh, you got the three G's, uh, God, gays, and guns. 
and those will always be issues, and uh, it's hard to, it's hard to deal with them. Uh, uh, that's the reason a lot of people don't want to get involved in politics today. You don't you just don't want to have to defend uh, a position, or you don't want to have to accuse somebody else and make them defend a position because that might be your position. So it's it's uh, you know it's it's tough. It's tough if you can. I've always said, and I, I told this to to uh, Senator Carter. The best thing to do in a political campaign, in my judgment, is to take three issues, no more than four, and build a fence around them, make them inviolate, build a fence around them. And when some reporter asks you, well, what do you think about such and such, you simply say, well, well I'll answer that question, but first let me tell you what I think about one, two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, by the time you've finished the question, controversial question, you have not answered because you don't want to answer it. And then they won't ask you, you know, again because nobody else will ask that question because George over here asked it and I don't want to ask the same question he did. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's the way to deal with that. Uh, it's maintaining a political philosophy throughout a campaign is very difficult because the media will either water it down so much that it's no longer that that there's no point in talking to them about it, or they will make it con so controversial you don't want to talk about it anymore because it makes you look bad. So, is the is the media more active in that today than they were when you were um, the person who was talking to the media? back in your day? Oh, well, yeah, they're much different today. They're much more different. They're, they're much more prying. They, uh, they look for reasons to tear you down. Uh, they didn't used to do that. When I was coming along there, the media was fair uh, in most cases, unless you really uh, messed up, you know, and they had every right to, to uh, hit you hard if you've made a mistake or you're doing something that you shouldn't do. I mean, that's just uh, a given. But back then, they were much, well, they were fair to, to Lester Maddox in most cases, except on the editorial pages. Mm -hmm. Now, that's where, that's where you have to draw the line, I think, is uh, editorially, they can rip you to pieces, while on the front page of the paper, your, your administration gets good, fair coverage. But today, with these people, well, look at it this way. What, what would have happened uh, uh, 20 years ago if politics was uh, on the television stations 24 hours a day? I mean, you run out of stuff to say, and you, you look for things that's different. I mean, you're competing with these people over here, so you've got to have something they don't have. So if you don't have it, you invent it or fix it so that, that somebody else will say something that will give you a lead over, the, over your competition. So the media, to me, is very, very disruptive in politics. Very disruptive and, and not always fair. And I think they deserve to be fair, not only with the candidates, uh, but also with the public. Do you think that that helps keep people out of politics? Yes. Maybe people who might be interested? Sure, yeah. I mean, you know, you have to bear your life in front of uh, the world, and nobody wants to do that. It, you know, you, you don't want to do that if for no other reason to protect your family. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want your children to know that when you're 16 years old, you got a DUI. I mean, I mean that's ridiculous to me. Mm -hmm. and, and I think all of that, uh, all that mudslinging is just is uncalled for. Mm -hmm. and, but you're going to see it because mm -hmm. that's the way people feel they get a political advantage. Mm -hmm. Don't you agree, Craig? I agree, Bob. Good. Uh, I think we're good. Thanks okay. Again. Thank you, sir. Oh, my pleasure. I just hope it works out all right.